for the record, the clerk will note that there is a quorum of both the council and the planning commission present. Our workshops are informal, so with that, I'm gonna dive right into our agenda. There are two discussion items on our agenda this evening. The first is a panel discussion hosted by the Urban Land Institute and focusing on affordable housing. Kicking us off this evening is our Community and Economic Development Director, Mr. Marty Dahl. Thank you, Mayor, members of the Council and Planning Commission. I am going to actually turn it directly over to Kathy Bennett with ULI to begin the workshop and uh, discussion. Terrific. Ms. Bennett, please join us. Thank you, Marty, and thank you, Victoria, um, City Council and Planning Commission members. Uh, we're excited to be here tonight, and um, what I wanted to do is just go through a very brief presentation to give you a little bit of information about what the Urban Land Institute is about, as well as what this session is about. I'll give some demographic data, high-level demographic data of Victoria, and then I added in some information about the post-pandemic impacts. I just thought it was very interesting. I heard it today and I wanted to just share that with you to kind of give some sense of what the future might be for cities like Victoria um, um, to, to get things started. Then we will dive into our panel discussion. I'm gonna wait um, until the end of my presentation to have the panelists introduce themselves. We have one person who is joining virtually and once my presentation is done, she will um, pop up on the screen and be part of the discussion as well. So with that, um, I will quickly um, give you a little bit of information about the Urban Land Institute. I think it was in your packet, but uh, ULI was founded in 1936 and it's the oldest and largest network of cross-disciplinary real estate and land use experts with already over 40,000 members worldwide. ULI Minnesota, we're a district council of the Urban Land Institute, and we are a nonprofit research and education organization supported by its members and sponsors. So how do we do our work? One of the main ways we do that is through the support and dedication of our annual sponsors, our real estate leaders, such as those that are at the table today, and also through the Regional Council of Mayors group, which the Urban Land Institute Minnesota has supported and coordinated since, night, since 2004. Since then, participation in the RCM has grown from eight mayors to more than 60 mayors. The RCM meets monthly, monthly over lunch to share their knowledge and experiences and work together on regional issues. Today, we had a meeting of the Regional Council of Mayors. It was a great meeting. It was held in the city of St. Louis Park, where they heard from three real estate experts on the future of the office space, as well as we had a presentation from Tom Fisher from the University of Minnesota on the future of post-pandemic cities. And I'm gonna share a little bit of that um, information that he shared with you today. The RCM is very um, committed to candid dialogue in the nonpartisan setting. Your mayor um, is, I know that she is a, a, a member of the Regional Council of Mayors. She tends when she can, and we really appreciate your support of this group. So what is it that we're, um, why are we here? Um, ULI Minnesota has our advisory services, which is the work that I support for ULI Minnesota. And it's about tapping into our real estate experts to provide technical assistance to the public sector. Our focus has been to help cities contend with the challenges of redevelopment brought on about uh, by economic conditions such as the pandemic and other economic conditions, demographic shifts and market changes. We have three specific offerings as part of our advisory services. The one that we're talking about tonight is called Navigating Your Competitive Future, and that's a two-hour workshop where we go out to cities with real estate experts to talk about different things. Tonight we'll be talking a little bit more focused about affordable housing. We also have a program called our Technical Assistance Panels, and those are more intensive, anywhere from a half day to two and a half days, where we really bring together a team of real estate experts to focus on a site. And then finally, we also serve as a best practice resource uh, for cities in the public sector. We do that in many ways. One is we convene a group of regional housing experts staff that come together to talk about issues and share knowledge. And I know Marty is part of that group um, that, we, that we meet over Zoom like once a month. 
And we also tap into not only our local research, but our worldwide research that then we share with cities. So since 2011, ULI Minnesota has held 95 workshops across the state. Um, it's hard for me to fathom that I've been up at these DSs around the table for 95, now 96 times. This map is the cities of where the workshops have been held. The darker colors are those that have held more than one session. And if you notice, Victoria is a darker color. Uh, we did a session here in 2015 and um, also in 2019. And I understand since then, there's been a lot of changes with council and planning commissions. And it, we thought it, uh, staff contact me and thought it might be a good time to do another one. And we're happy to be here. For tonight's session, like I mentioned, I'm going to um, uh, give some demographic information and then we'll dig into the panel questions. And we're going to leave plenty of time for your questions and dialogue. We really want to make sure that is a, it is a discussion, that they're here to kind of answer your questions. And so please don't be shy. Dive in. Just let me know that you have a question um, for the panelists or uh, for some of the information that we're providing. So very quickly, um, this is some information about Victoria. I refer to this as the quick facts. And while some of the data has been released for the 2020 census, um, it really hasn't been drilled down to this level. So this data is still American Community Survey 2019 data, just so that you know that. So for instance, uh, the household income in Victoria is about 152,000. I think I looked for the 2020, it maybe is up to like 160 plus thousand. Um, that's higher than Carver County. And the average annual wage of the, the companies that are in Victoria is only about 49,000. So there's kind of like this disconnect and we'll talk about that a little bit more. The medium gross rent is about $1,300 per month, and that went up since 2014 of, of about 45% increase. Obviously, that's probably because you had some new product come online that, online that was newer. But cities across the whole metro area have seen an increase in rents, um, so that it's not uncommon. And you know, the, the face of our residents are changing. Um, in Victoria, you, uh, there's about 9% of BIPOC population, which is black indigenous people of color. And that's uh, lower than Carver County overall. And that was up uh, from 6% in 2010. And there's only about 3% of the people who are below the poverty level. And that's a very low income of about 15,000 per year. That really hasn't changed since 2010, which is a good thing. However, 12% of all the households in Victoria are what is we refer to as cost burdened households. And what that means is that uh, people who are paying more than 30% of their income on housing. And it's disproportionate to those who are homeowners as well as those who are renters. And 30% of your jobs are in retail trade, accommodation and food service and construction industries. And the average wage of these jobs is about $12 to $18 per hour. That's only a salary of about twenty dollars to 30000 annual salary. Um, these positions generally do not necessarily pay a wage on their own that is sufficient to afford housing within your community. And likely those people are working in these industry sectors are either commuting out from outside the city, maybe part of a dual or either, even a triple plus household, and or are cost burden, but maybe in many cases what we refer to as severely cost burden, which means that they pay more than 50% of their income on housing. So what does this mean? It's all about this housing wage. A housing wage represents what a worker needs to earn to afford rent or mortgage without paying more than that 30% of their income on housing. In Carver County, for both renters and owners, incomes are not rising as much as housing costs, resulting in an increase in the number of cost burden households and putting pressure on the demand for more housing at a lower cost. In Victoria, you have, you're mostly ownership housing. About 88% of uh, your residents are owners and about 12% are renters. There is a widening gap between the wages and the housing costs and the median earnings for the most of the top in demand and growing jobs, such as those in healthcare and personal care aides, retail salespersons, order fillers, do not cover housing costs at an affordable level. 
An average renter in the Twin Cities would have to pay much more than they can afford for a modest apartment, and a minimum wage wor worker, for instance, must work more than one full-time job or over 75 hours per week to afford a one-bedroom apartment. And, you know, we see that this is not sustainable, and I think you as a community see that that's not sustainable as well. So I'm going to shift to some of these post-pandemic impacts. I mean, I think everybody has felt that um, the pandemic has impacted their lives in some way, and it's changed the way we work. It's changed the way how it's changed how we shop, and it's also changed uh, the way uh, we drive around the roads and the infrastructure that we knew uh, we we need and use. So quickly, I'm just going to go for, through a few slides about that, and we'll get into the uh, panel presentation. And this is mostly based on national survey data. So just so you're aware, um, if, I, if I'm not saying it's Twin Cities, it's national survey data. So prior to the pandemic, about 20% of the US workforce worked from home. But that grew to 71% uh, once the pandemic came. And it's estimated that there's no going back to the old normal. 54% uh, of the respondents to a survey reported that they wanted to continue to work from home at least part of the week once the pandemic ended. Among those who like, tele who like telecommuting, 67% say that they feel more connected to their family, while among those who do not, 74% say that it blurs work and life and family life. And 58 say that they feel disconnected from coworkers. And what we found is that this is kind of a generational issue. Um, those who maybe are established in their work, um, their work life and our middle management to upper management levels or director levels, they feel like working from home is a good option um, because they already have their networks um, in place and are connected. Those of the younger generation are mostly the ones that are feeling disconnected by working from home and the need to have more interaction. And then it's completely different based upon industry sectors as well. And 30% um, of those workers within the workforce are unable to work from home because they're in careers that require them to be um, at, on site, such as people in manufacturing, people uh, who work in the healthcare industries, retail, um, et cetera, maybe city, city hall, city staff, police, fire, those, those types of industries. So what about the way we shop? That's changed significantly as well. During the pandemic, online purchases of many goods <laughs> soared. Medical supplies went up 500%, baby products 400%, groceries 150%. Meanwhile, many bricks and mortar st uh, stores struggled. I don't know if you have experienced that in your, in your downtown area or with some of your um, retail commercial centers. One study indicated that the retail sector may lose 11 to 70% of stores by 2025, with 100,000 to 150,000 store closings in the next five years in the US. And it's predicted that the pandemic only accelerated a trend that was already underway. One study showed, for example, that 81% of those who shopped online for groceries during the pandemic intended to do so afterwards. So that really impacts the way that we shop, the way that we get around. A, a study uh, of repurposed shopping malls showed that almost 70% had been converted to uses ranging from housing, offices, warehouses, to churches, medical clinics, and entertainment centers. There's an increase in the need for these flexible spaces where the one one zoning type maybe doesn't work anymore. And um, the future of how people work, shop, live is gonna be more blended. And that's something that I think cities will have to think about as they're looking at different uses. And then finally, uh, there's infrastructure changes. A Star Tribune article in 2020 indicated that on average in the metro area, People spent nine hours stuck in gridlock compared to 52 hours prior to the pandemic. And people traveled 23% fewer miles between 2019 and 2020. In the beginning of 2021, traffic was down overall by 52% with the largest reduction during commuting time. Now, some days that might not feel that way. I think traffic is getting busier, but what I feel is like traffic is getting busier all the time because people have much more flexible working schedules. So it, it's changed. Um, 
One area that has increased the most is delivery jobs, which grew 22% in 2020 and is the fastest growing profession in the US. And I don't know if anybody's tried to buy a bike, but bike sales has soared like significantly. Um, it took my husband almost nine months to get a bike that he wanted. So uh, you as a city with the great trail access, maybe you're capitalizing on this or, uh, or have an opportunity to capitalize on that as your residents may want to commute to work and have the option to do it because you have a bike trail right, right out your front door. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and sit down and we're going to introduce our great panelists and we're going to bring Kathy up and we'll get into our panel discussion. So maybe what I'll do is, Kathy, can you hear us? Kathy, can I you hear can. us? Yes. I can't. We can't hear you, Kathy. Uh, I am unmuted. Nope. Still not hearing you. Kathy, maybe try and fix that, and we will uh, have the other panelists introduce themselves. Chris, why don't you start? Uh, hi, I'm uh, Chris Wilson. I work for a project for Pride Living. Uh, we are a nonprofit agency uh, working in the Twin Cities. Been around since 1972. Um, little advertisement for PPL. We do two things. Um, we do uh, job training and career readiness. And then we also do housing, uh, affordable housing, um, mostly exclusively. Um, we do uh, some for sale and then all the way down to kind of uh, rental and, and very affordable rental. Um, I obviously work on the housing side. Um, I've been there for 24 years, um, and uh, we probably build about 100 or 150 units a year, um, and we own and manage about 1,600 units, just to kind of give you a sense of our size. Um, most of that, about half of it, is uh, actually for, for very low-income folks at 30% of the area median. So uh, that's just kind of a little sense of our portfolio. Great. Paul? Uh, good evening. My name is Paul Manor, and I'm the Executive Vice President of Axial Real Estate Advisors. We are, I'm the, uh, the private market participant uh, on the panel this evening. We are investors in residential property and commercial property historically, but residential property more recently. We have a focus on market rate multifamily property we also have an interest in senior living, assisted living uh, property, as well as active adult communities um, that are emerging as another product type in the senior space. We also have an interest in um, the uh, workforce housing sector, uh, keeping property affordable and finding affordable opportunities for people is of interest to us on a workforce housing basis, and that's got a lot of different gradations to that, uh, which I'm sure we'll get into here. Uh, but we are all things housing uh, at this moment in time, and I lead our development initiatives. Uh, we joint venture partner with development groups as well as acquire properties uh, directly from owners. Great. Mary? I'm Mary Tingerthal. Um, from 2011 to 2019, I served as the housing commissioner at Minnesota Housing and had the opportunity to meet with many public officials and uh, travel the state uh, doing the full spectrum of housing finance. Uh, in my background, uh, I've also been a mortgage banker. I've been uh, head of the National Equity Fund, uh, which syndicates low-income housing tax credits, which you'll hear a little bit more about. And I've been a lender both in the nonprofit sector and in the private sector. So, uh, before that, I was uh, the housing director for the city of St. Paul, so I've been a local public official as well. Uh, after I left Minnesota Housing, uh, when, with the change of administration, I decided I wasn't quite done uh, fighting the good fight for uh, making the case for affordable housing in more places and with more people. And uh, I've had the opportunity to work with a company that I'll talk more about later, uh, called Rise Modular, uh, which is the first fully commercial uh, modular construction company for uh, residential in the upper Midwest. So uh, that's been interesting and has really put me uh, back on the development side a little bit and share some of those observations with you later. And finally, I've done 
a recent uh, contract uh, with the National Alliance to End Homelessness on the conversion of non-residential properties like hotels, convents, monasteries, dormitories into permanent housing. So uh, hopefully can bring some ideas uh, to the table for you to think about as you move forward. Great, Kathy, are we able to hear you now? I don't know, or can you hear me? Yes, yes. we can hear you. Go ahead and introduce okay. yourself. <laughs> okay, Kathy Lawrence, I'm the Chief Development Officer at Twin Cities Habitat for Humanity. Uh, Twin Cities Habitat is one of 1,100 affiliated habitats throughout the United States. We're also in 70 different countries. Uh, Twin Cities itself is uh, one of the largest affiliates in the affordable homeownership space, not only in, within the habitat world, uh, but period, uh, in the Twin Cities area. Um, we, and I can get into this more of this later, we, uh, we serve about, uh, we provide about 100 to 125 affordable mortgages on an annual basis, and we have really ambitious plans to even grow that more. And I'll talk more about that later. Great. So let's start with some panel questions to get us kicked off here. And, and Paul, I think I'm going to start with you. As the representative for the private market, market, what do developers look for in a community? And what role does a mix of housing options play in a city's overall economic development strategy? Uh, great question. A lot, uh, lot to unpack there. I think uh, the way I'd like to approach, uh, as I thought about this question, the way I'd like to approach this uh, just to help set the table a little bit for our discussion is just very briefly talk about the development process. Um, and in terms of what developers, both for-profit developers as well as uh, non-profit developers are looking for in a community. The first step that any group would do is to try to identify gaps in the marketplace, meaning what is not there and what need is currently not being served in that community. Next step is to try to find um, relevant site opportunities that might accommodate a development that fill that gap in the marketplace. Again, this is the developer mindset as they come into a community. And from there, to the extent they identify an opportunity that they could uh, develop to help fill that gap, people will then dig into the, the public process in terms of looking at the printed information, the online information relative to the zoning, what is possible, what is the comprehensive land use, recommending for growth in the community, and trying to handicap whether they feel as if they will have an opportunity to help fill that gap in the marketplace. That applies across the board. And the reason I, I set the stage for that is for people to, uh, development groups, to come into a community and to really analyze what the opportunities may be. There is a fair amount of speculative money that individuals and corporations and partnerships need to spend in order to determine whether they genuinely have a development opportunity that they can help execute in that community. And those dollar amounts can get rather large. And so things that the, uh, the development community will look for in a community, at least from a municipal standpoint and an entitlement standpoint, would be one of predictability meaning is there good synergy between the staff and the staff recommendations and the staff um, uh, as it reviews potential planning and alignment, if you will, with a city council. Uh, being able to understand that going in, again, helps individuals and, and partnerships to shepherd the resources that they have for, for expending the energy to try to bring a development to fruition. Transparency. You know, what is the fee structure? Uh, what are the opportunities if the particular project has a need to help fill a gap? And we're going to probably talk a lot about that this evening because on the, de uh, the housing development side right now, it's, it's frankly a math problem. And the math problem is, is that it costs what it costs to build a community and yet the rents are only able to support so much of that cost. And most frequently uh, in today's world with the costs doing what they are, there are gaps that are getting uh, increasingly more difficult to bridge. So understanding what the municipal uh, opportunities are from a development uh, toolbox standpoint, that's helpful, but also understanding what the fee structure is and really what is required to, 
to help uh, bring a project to fruition. That may be all very basic, and you guys have done this before, but it, it just I felt it was important to help sort of set the stage for what, did the, what does the development community look for in a community, and starting with the, 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 the municipal process after someone has identified or identified a gap in the market and potential site opportunities that they could develop to fill that gap. Great. Um, just pushing on that a little bit, getting back to kind of specifics on housing um, and some of the work that you do, uh, when you look at a different market for housing and the gaps, do you kind of understand and look for the synergy of this different range of housing, anywhere from ownership to rental to senior to first time buyer? And why is that important in your opinion? Uh, it, it, it's important for a, a, a variety of reasons. I mean, the mix is good for any community to help create that variety and to create, as you said, the, 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 the synergy between those uses. Developers are looking for the gaps, and the development community is very good at identifying what is not currently being represented in the community, and to the extent that there is one particular slice that uh, isn't being served, Perhaps there's a senior angle or a senior product that is, is in need for that community. That can be really crucial in order to entice seniors to, to your community, but one of the things that we're also observing is that there is a, a propensity of younger people to want, or uh, seniors, I, I should say, to want to uh, try to locate around where their adult children are. There is um, uh, sort of a euphemism out there about um, seniors that are termed baby chasers in that they are, they are moving to be closer to their families. Um, lives are complicated today, and to be raising families uh, frequently, uh, seniors would like to participate in that, in that family process. So having that range of options to help, and that's just one small example, but having that range of options to help fill those uh, evolutions in the marketplace, if you will, is is important. Obviously, affordability is 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 huge, and creating as much of the 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 range of affordability as possible, I think, helps add to the richness of a community. So we look for that. We look for how are the various segments of the population being served, and if there again are those gaps, how can we help our development partners fill those gaps? Great, so I'll, so I'll go into a question for Chris as uh, the developer of affordable housing. The data indicates that there's great demand for affordable housing anywhere and everywhere. Uh, what does it take to put together a, deer, a deal for affordable workforce housing project? Sure, thanks, Kathy. Um, and uh, unlike Paul, I don't worry about the market too much uh, just because as, as Kathy said, the affordable is needed everywhere, so um, that's not, not something I usually lose sleep over since our product is sort of, at, you know, typically at 75% off of what the market is, is uh, charging for rent, for example. Um, and I think, as Kathy mentioned, just to, you know, to set the, the stage for that, you know, wages have not kept up with, with production costs. I mean, you've kind of heard that again. It'll, kinda, it'll be kind of a recurring theme here. And as that happens, fewer and fewer people are able to kind of comfortably afford a place to live. And so that um, we try and come in and sort of fill the gap uh, on that. Um, and the, and the, way that we, uh, the way that we're able to do it, there's sort of two methods that the government takes essentially to do that. Either you kind of subsidize people's um, ability to pay rent in one way or another, um, or you subsidize the capital cost of the building with the promise that you will keep the rent slow, which is typically the way we work. And that's the way that the tax credit program works. So essentially, um, the government, uh, someone will come to me. I'm going I'm to pick on Deborah. She's a mayor here. So she's going to come to me. She said, Chris, I'd like you to do a project here. Um, I'm going to give you some money here. But you, in exchange for that, you build the building, and you must keep the rent slow for, for 30 years at least. And typically, we sign up for 45 years, just to give you an example. And so it, it um, typically involves something uh, of that nature. Uh, but it's not just one part of the government. The, the tax credit program is kind of the 
kind of the, the mainstay or kind of the main way that, that we've been doing that since 1986. And the tax credit essentially says, um, I will give you a credit roughly equal to the cost of the uh, of your project. Let's say it's a $10 million project. It's roughly $10 million. I'm going to give it to you over 10 years, and you build the building. Now, PPL, uh, who I work for, we are a non nonprofit, so we don't need the tax credits. So what I do is I turn around and I'll sell them to like Paul or somebody like that that, that has a, a, a uh, uh, needs to pay taxes, and we'll, they will buy the credits from us. We'll use the capital uh, from the credits to build the building and to kind of get it going there. So I'm just, I'm kind of giving you, as hopefully we're maybe, I want to get into the weeds enough that you understand it, but not too much that you, everybody goes, oh my God, don't stop talking. So <laughs> anyway, um, so that, that's just kind of generally the way that works. And that pays for a good chunk of, of a project if we're doing a project. So if I were going to do a family project out here, um, that might be about two thirds of the project if I had, if I had, a certain type of tax credit um, in there, um, and, and um, typically, then I have a I'd have a syndicator, I'd have a partner that would buy the tax credits from us, and then they own 99.99 percent of the building for the 15-year compliance period, sort of 10 years while they get their tax credits back, and then five more years after that, just to to kind of give you a pretty uh, typical, for instance, so that. You think that's kind of interesting, right? So that's a little piece of it. That's maybe two thirds of it, um, uh, and then the other third of it is made up of uh, probably a, I might have an amortizing loan. Just kind of go to the bank, uh, but I've kept my rents really low, so the bank's not going to loan me that much money. They're going to go, okay, I see you're keeping your rents low. Okay, yeah, you got a little bit left over after your operations go away, so you got a little bit left over. I'll, I'll loan you. X amount of money. It's typically about 10% on that deal that I just described. I got about two thirds of it, maybe 60% from the tax credits. I got another 10% from the bank who's given me the loan on that. So I'm still missing about 30% of the cost of the, of the project. And so then I'm going to go to um, the, the housing finance agency, which uh, Mary used to be in charge of. Uh, so I, I asked Mary for money until recently. Uh, <laughs> and uh, um, so I'd go to the housing finance agency, so the state has resources um, that they would give out to kind of help pay that 30% gap or so. Um, typically go to the county. We will, you know, kind of all the levels of government. Typically we'll go to the city as well. Um, and one of the ways that the cities participate sort of in different ways, um, sometimes it'll be TIF. Uh, sometimes, and I, I won't go into what, you all know what that is, right? Okay, okay, I figured that, but... Uh, um, sometimes it'll be TIF, sometimes it'll be like a land write down, uh, sometimes it'll be kind of a, a fee waiver, sometimes it'll be like, oh, you can build a couple more stories um, than, than we'd normally allow you to build, or we'll dial your parking down a little bit. You know, there's little horse trading type things of, the, of that nature um, that kind of increase the, the, the value for us. So those are the typical things the city does. Um, other people that we might get involved would be the Federal Home Loan Bank. Um, um, if it's a sort of a very low income project, they like to uh, be involved. Um, and the Met Council, uh, we might have the Watershed District. Um, you guys have a lot of nice lakes out here, so um, Watershed District sometimes has some money that they want to spend to make sure that, um, you know, the, the water that gets into the lake is really clean. So, um, and then sometimes there's environmental money from DEED or someone else uh, to kind of uh, pay for the environmental. So. You know, it is not unusual for me to go in and do a project with a, a, basically what I'm calling a capital stack, but essentially all the money to pay for the project, and I've got eight or ten different slices in there um, of different sizes uh, uh, and, and with different requirements and with different expenditures. So it's, it's kind of like if you want to buy a house, and instead of, you know, taking your down payment and going to the bank and saying, hey, um, will you loan me the money for the house? They'd say, oh, I'll loan you a tenth of the money for the house. Now you've got to go to the other bank, and they're going to loan you a tenth, and then the next bank over is going to loan you a tenth, and the next bank over is going to loan you a tenth. And so it's just, it's just a fairly complex transaction. Um, and um, our, I, I, you know, everybody who works for me, and my job is a marathon. It's, not a, it's a marathon with moments of sprinting. Um, so uh, it, just, it takes a long time, two to, two to four or five years is more typical just to set up a deal. If we sat down tonight and said, Chris, 
I got a spot for you here, man. Go to it, knock it out. Uh, it'd be probably three years before we broke ground and another year to build a building. Mr. Wilson, is a lot of that competitive money? You know, are you are you competing with other communities for that money? Yes. And what are some of the criteria that we would need to meet in order to be eligible for some Great. of those dollars? Uh, excellent questions. Uh, so uh, it is all competitive. So every, every one of those, so um, when I go to talk to the housing finance agency, uh, they are typically subscribed three or four to one. So they've got three or four projects competing for the same dollar. Um, uh, Again, the city is sometimes a little less so because you you know you don't have a whole ton of things. But in the, in, in Minneapolis, for example, you know very competitive as well. Um, and then the uh, the Met Council is competitive. The Federal Home Loan Bank is competitive. Um, um, the the county money is competitive, and typically each of them has their own RFP for it. They have their own qualified plan. They say, okay, here are the things that I want. You know, I want you to meet them. And because it is competitive, actually, um, I would say probably in the last 10 or 15 years, the, the criteria has ramped up a bit. So um, one of the things that the, that the state agency in particular is interested in is providing housing for people at the, at the lowest income levels. And so they have encouraged me to sort of dial down rents even further. Um, and and the, your, your projects become more competitive as you, as you begin to kind of hit those uh, types of uh, thresholds. Um, so, so yes, everything is um, uh, tends to be competitive. One of the things um, that that you could do that I think would be helpful, um, the the uh, the state agency who would who would have kind of control of the tax credits um, for your region um, is is always interested in leverage. In, in other words, it's having other other people's money in the deal, basically. And so, um, so if I go in and I take my project in and I say, oh, look, I've got money from the county, I've got money from the city, I've got money from the Federal Home Loan Bank, then they're like, oh, that means I get to put in less money. And so I like that. And so I'm going to give you, I'm going to score you better for that. Basically, we're going to get a better score for that. So, um, so any of those types of things. Similarly, if the city, you know, what they want to see is just that the city has interest in doing it, that they have skin in the game. You know, so it could be, again, I, I, you know, we've waived, your, we've waived your park dedication fee. Um, we've allowed you to, you know, to do less parking than we might normally. Um, any of those types of things um, are, are uh, you know, are helpful and, and just sort of give the signal to, to the state agency or to, to kind of all the other players, to the county as well, that, that the city is really, um, you know, committed to committed to, to kind of doing that, and um, and so all of those things are, are all, you know, are all kind of helpful. Um, if you have, um, uh, you know, if you have regular regulatory, you know, kind of uh, easements, if you will, uh, uh, you know, if you have uh, uh, things like, okay, we don't really. Um, we don't have anything. I, I notice your city. You don't have too much four-story stuff. So if you say, okay, you can, you know, you can do something that's four stories. That's not normally what we'd do. But in your case, again, just something that's demonstrating your level of commitment to it. Mary, anything to add as the former housing commissioner on so that information? Um, one thing I would say is that uh, at least uh, for the state. The scoring system is pretty visible, pretty transparent. And the developers that uh, you would want to pick to work with are pretty good at what I would call pre-scoring a project. So early in the planning process, when you've identified what might be a piece of land that would be a good fit and where is it located, um, Chris, if you hired PPL to be your developer, would say, um, well, that's a nice piece of land, but it's going to score pretty low because of where it's located and some of the characteristics um, of that area. You know, is there something over in this area over here where uh, we might be able to get a better score with the project? What so, are some of those characteristics? Are they things like the public transit? Are they things like within neighborhoods? What? Give me an example of what that might look like. 
Um, there really are a variety. Uh, this past year, there was actually a set of points for cities that hadn't gotten a project before. So there was a bonus if you had not had a project in the most recent five years. Um, there are points around uh, schools, transportation, uh, level of income. Uh, Chris, what am Trans I? Uh, uh, transportation is a good one. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, oh, I had another one. Walkability, walkability. also helpful um, if you have, uh, uh, you know, family, if things are easily family accessed. Uh, right. I'm sorry, what did you say, Mr. Maynard? Family or families versus singles. Okay, got it. Um, although that's changing a little bit, so okay. didn't, didn't mention that one. And it changes every year, but it is publicly announced and um, it's available in advance, about a year in advance, so that a community and a developer working together can really make an assessment. Is this going to be a competitive year for our process? It's it's far from perfect, but uh, it at least does give you some predictability of whether it looks like the project that you have in mind uh, will be workable. Is it listed on, on the website? Is there a website that we go to to see that information? There is. Mm -hmm. um, it's not exactly easy it's, reading. It, you can get there. <laughs> you can get there. We have uh, really awesome you staff. To to, you need to go to Minnesota Housing. Uh, mnhousing.gov. Yep. MNHousing. And then it's community profiles, right, Mary? Right. Yeah, community so profiles. And there's a map there. There's, there, a there's actually a geospatial uh, map, mm -hmm. um, and you can uh, zero in on Victoria and see the points for those items that are related to geography. So. Um, you know, we, you, you can't change where you're located, so, but it will tell you within the boundaries of Victoria um, which areas have might points? have higher points. Do you know how many projects over the last five years have been done in Carver County? Oh boy, I don't have that oh, right off. We have this yeah. Carver County representative here. Three. 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 <laughs> and where are they located? Um, Carver Crossings is in the city of Carver. And that was developed in 2016. Um, Vista Ridge just opened in Laconia um, last fall, 2020. Um, and then our new project, Trails Edge South, which we'll, I'll talk about when at the end when we get up that, we just broke ground in Laconia last week. The question here? Um, would you say it's a true statement that proximity to an employer would have a higher ranking as well? I don't think that that is currently in the scoring. I think sort of, I don't want to work on it, sort of growth community or, you know, community where there's access to jobs. I think part of it is that they, you know, they don't want to invest in, let's say, something, you know, way out in southwestern Minnesota where there actually isn't job growth. And, you know, um, so I, I think being part of the metro area, that's probably a, a, not, a, not an issue, but... Uh, but that's also part of the, this criteria. And just, I did look it up, sorry. If I Go ahead. Yep, yep. Up, sorry. Uh, I did look it up, and, and much of Victoria is not in what I would consider a really high scoring spot. So, so uh, if, why is that? Yeah. And if I, that was the case. Store, no public transportation. I mean, how do you think yeah. <laughs> but, if, but if that's the case, is there a way that the cities can uh, be more supportive to increase the? That maybe. Uh, so, thinking about this, right? So, talking about development. So, right, Victoria has a lot of opportunity for development in the next few years. Um, and looking at it, you know, it's kind of, it's kind of. I feel like it's a chicken egg thing, right? So we, we, we want, right? Like we're very uh, restaurant bar oriented for work right now, right? So, you know, you look at it and you say we want affordable housing or workforce housing but we don't have the jobs for people here. We want to try and get more jobs here because we want to increase our business, but we don't have workforce housing, right? Is that, you know, are they, generally do you see that stuff come in kind of simultaneously? Do you see one come first and then, okay, the jobs are there, now we start building affordable housing and the people come in? Jump in, anyone. Uh, uh, announcements uh, uh, agreed it's a chicken and egg situation I guess this is part of the the communications uh, that, that the city would have about uh, its its growth profile or its growth planning for uh, 
corporate development and the types of jobs that it's looking for and the and that you are actively outsourcing and in conversation with corporations for potential um, uh, relocations or new facilities, et cetera. I mean, that just, that's again part of developers identifying the gap in that if, if, if there's active discussion and active news, if you will, about things that might be happening in Victoria, I mean, that helps build the case for identifying a, a gap and and filling it. Oh, go ahead. I, I just, in my opinion, Victoria Works has the best recipe to create that. Um, in my personal opinion, I mean, we, we can create the workforce, we can create the housing with much less obstacles, in my opinion. So one thing I would say is um, there's a there's one source of affordable financing that will tend to be um, not quite as targeted to the lowest income, and that's financing through mm -hmm. tax-exempt bonds, yeah. uh, which will also bring some uh, tax credits with them. Um, it's trickier to make it work. It's typically going to require local subsidy of some sort, either a tax increment financing district or some sort of local housing trust fund or something like that to kind of close the gap. But that is, um, it has to meet certain threshold criteria, but it's not as subject to the geographic criteria that we were talking about right. earlier. I think that's a really good point. I think they're, again, not to get into the weeds too much, but there's 4% credits in the bonds, um, which uh, they're kind of half the value of the, the so I sort of described uh, a 9% deal where you're, you know, you've got about 65% or 60% of the cost sort of being paid by, for by the tax credits. There's a 4% deal, which, you know, is more like half of that or a little less than half. And so, um, so you know, you're looking at between the 4% the credits, uh, credits come with the bonds, um, you know, you've got again, again, you're back sort of at about two thirds. You have more debt on the project, but you've still got a kind of a gap at, at the end of it. Um, but if you can fill that up, right, that that actually is probably a much better route to go uh, than than to try and trying to wade into the to the nine percent thing, um, uh, particularly out here too, because I think uh, there's probably some other things that that would work well in the area. So oh, go ahead, Mary. I'm sorry. Oh, um, one thing I wanted to add. Um, as I've kind of listened to the discussion here is, as I traveled around the state, where I saw communities having probably the best uh, prospects in terms of meeting what they want to do for their housing in their community is where those communities are really proactive and saying to their staff, we want to, we want to have some say in what, how housing develops here. And there's a couple of things that I've seen communities do that can be very effective, and you may have done some of them already. Um, one of them is to do a housing study, to look maybe not just at the boundaries of Victoria, but maybe the surrounding areas, because as we know, people don't stop at the boundaries, but you could well be a great place for a mix of people to live, even though they may not work in Victoria, but may work very close by. But a housing study can really help the, everybody coalesce and say, oh my gosh, you know, we really could use uh, a couple hundred units of this kind of housing. And, you know, in the absence of having a proactive role, what you will continue to get, I would guess, is people coming here to build subdivisions. Um, and if you want to have an opinion that you want something in addition to subdivisions, then, or that you want your sub subdivisions to include uh, rental single family, or you want your subdivisions to include twin homes, um, having a view about it and really working with your staff to not just put a zoning map out there because that you know that's one layer of this is what we'd like 
but taking it to the next layer and saying, well, you know, how many units do we really want to try to attract here? And then kind of the final step in that process is not just waiting till Paul shows up, but actually reaching out to developers before they come to your door and saying, hey, you know, we're really looking to develop 150 units of workforce housing in Victoria. You know, we'd like it, you know, in one of these locations. Is that the kind of housing you do, Paul? Or, and, you know, through ULI or others can really connect you with uh, developers that may not be thinking about Victoria. They've never worked in Victoria before and may not think to look here. But through some dialogue, you can begin to shape a little bit more which developers you end up um, having an ability to work with. It's a, it's a really good point because what you're describing is the community taking a proactive approach to identifying those gaps. And by then communicating that and telegraphing that to the development community, it will generate the conversation and it will generate the, the interest in your community. I think it's, I just want to comment on one thing, you know, market rate housing, um, there is a variety of market rate housing that is currently being developed today. There are the highly amenitized luxury market rate apartment projects that are currently being developed. But there's also a, a, a number of groups that are out actively building a, a, a less amenitized or less, um, uh, call it uh, attainable luxury, um, as they, some of them describe it, but, but, but less uh, fully developed as the more luxury uh, projects. And, th and these are brand new communities that have fewer amenities, they have uh, less common area space, they're more efficient, um, but the goal is to, in those projects, is to tr try to create as much living space within the community as possible to make it the most efficient building that you can actually construct in today's world. And by doing so, you're actually offering an, uh, 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 an opportunity for someone to move in at rents that are less than that luxurious market rate project. So th they are out there and they candidly are looking at the Victorias of the world and are looking for opportunities um, where they can implement that type of strategy. And I also want, um, I also want to add that Habitat has had the opportunity to participate in a couple of those larger type subdivision, uh, for example, in Woodbury in Cottage Grove, well, where there is very high end housing uh, down to more moderate priced housing, Habitat was given the ability to put in twin homes, as Mary mentioned, it's usually a good option for us. Um, we were often sited nearer to the community center, you know, where there was a playground and there might be a community building for that subdivision. That was actually our favorite place to build because it gave our families access uh, to those amenities. Uh, but we were, we were always uh, ready to go and, and welcomed into those communities and we provide that affordable housing option so they have a much more diversified housing uh, ecosystem in some of those subdivisions. We, uh, and I should add that, uh, and this is a whole nother conversation probably for another night, but we, uh, because of that type of subdivision housing, uh, we did land trust um, those properties which is not usually the case with a habitat home, uh, but that is to ensure the long-term affordability uh, for future families in those homes. So Kathy, while you're, while you're talking, why don't you explain a little bit about the habitat model and um, describe who your clients are and how does this model support um, building wealth uh, for lower income households? Sure, I'd be happy to. So everybody knows habitat. Um, uh, but we're a, we are a really complex organization, and we're complex because we are the we're the builder, we're the developer, we're the builder, we're the bank, and we also run a variety of programs. Uh, we've been around for quite a while. Uh, as I mentioned in my intro, we are one of the largest habitats uh, in the country, and we call ourselves the largest uh, affordable single-family uh, developer in the Twin Cities area. Um, we're complicated because we're a nonprofit. So historically, 
we uh, and Mary's very familiar with with our uh, model where we uh, used to leverage our own balance sheet because we hold 30-year mortgages. So we had a very strong balance sheet in which to leverage to build more each year. Uh, years ago, the board decided that that really inhibited our growth. So we uh, embarked on creating a, a relationship with the bank. It started out being a very complicated uh, structured uh, tranche uh, loan fund. Uh, that when we, uh, and Minnesota Housing was a part of that, as were other banks in the community. When we presented it to Bremer Bank, Bremer said, too complicated, too much risk for you. Uh, we're simply going to become your secondary market. We would like to purchase all of your mortgages. For Habitat, that was a game changer because then we had enough mortgage capital for our first mortgages uh, to offer lots of other alternatives for families. So the traditional habitat is where we utilize volunteers from the community to come in and build homes from scratch. We get those lots from cities. We get them from counties. We get them from foreclosed properties, uh, especially after the, the banking crisis. Um, we get land donations. Uh, and I'll talk about one in a little bit, a, a million dollar land donation that came to us from an entity up in Hugo. Uh, so. Oftentimes, um, they're single families scattered within neighborhoods. Uh, other times, they are their own little subdivision, and we do them both. Uh, we build single family standalone. We've done duplexes. We've gone up to four and five plexes. Um, and, um, and I'll quickly talk about kind of the five buckets that we currently have. So again, the habitat built with volunteers. We also do what we call next generation homes, and those are homes that Habitat buys back. So every time we put a mortgage on a house, we have the first right of refusal to repurchase that when the Habitat homeowner chooses to move on. They leave their houses for the exact same reasons any of us do. Uh, they want to downsize, they want to upsize, they want a different neighborhood, they're retiring, there's a death, any of those kinds of things. Uh, we, we have the first right to buy that back and almost always we repurchase that house, we put some modest rehab into that, and then we sell it to another family that's in our um, uh, one of our clients. Uh, the third way, which is relatively new, and we just started doing this about four years ago but due to the Bremer relationship, is we actively purchase starter homes in our market area, so the seven-county metro area. We tend to do that in second and third ring suburbs. Again, transportation, closeness to jobs are really important things for, for our home buyers. Uh, but given the escalation in price, we can go out in that market, we can do a cash closing very quickly, uh, no contingencies because we bring our uh, uh, home buying folks out with us and they can do the inspection on the site. And generally, we can get those properties for about 10% under that asking price, which is you know very unusual in these markets, but we've had some success. <clears throat> The fourth and fifth options for folks to partner with us is they are simply using our mortgage. And so uh, they can actually partner with a real estate agent and purchase a home anywhere in the seven county metro area uh, using our programming. And we do think our programming is the secret sauce. Every home buyer goes through uh, financial literacy, often with another agency, then financial coaching with us. They go through uh, what, it, what it takes to be a homeowner what it takes to have that mortgage, what it takes to be a good community member, uh, how to maintain that property. And uh, we do strongly believe that our programming is the secret sauce to our success. Um, who are our clients? They are um, a lot of the people that you talked about earlier, Kathy. Um, they are those uh, those service industry workers. They're the people that are that kept, you know, they really were the essential workers that uh, kept our economy going during COVID, uh, pre-COVID, and they will continue to keep the economy going uh, post-COVID. They are Uber drivers. They are healthcare workers. They are the cashier at your grocery store. And oftentimes, I will tell people, uh, you come across potential Habitat home buyers every day. Send them to us. Uh, because as as much as we can do, I will say that the Habitat brand can sometimes get in our way uh, because folks think, think that we are just for very low income people and that we give houses away and we don't. Every Habitat um, homeowner has an affordable mortgage. Much like Kathy talked about earlier, 
we tie our mortgage uh, into 30% of that family's income. Uh, again, we believe, like everybody else, that uh, if you're paying more than 30%, you don't have the resources to save for future education, to pay for your medications, to buy healthy foods, uh, all those things that, that families need. And so we lock that into 30% of their income. Uh, our relationship with Bremer allows us right now to have a below market um, uh, interest rate for those home buyers. And then we stack that. Um, and, you know, what do we need from, from our partners in, in government all the way, all the way through government? Uh, we need opportunity for to close that development gap, uh, and more importantly, we need uh, resources to fill that affordability gap for people. So you lock that mortgage in, and the value of that home is that much higher, and we stack those public resources, and we stack philanthropy in, into that to close that gap so people can uh, can afford that house. We know the benefits of that. We've done, uh, we have qualitative research, but we also have quantitative research that we partnered with Wilder a couple years back. It was a statewide survey, uh, but people um, felt, had so much more stability. They had stability, uh, you talk about your workforce wanting stability, home ownership is one of the keys to that. They're invested in their communities, they're invested in their school systems. Children no longer have uh, mobility issues, having to pick up and change school districts because their rent changed and they had to move. Uh, and we see tremendous health impacts. Um, we have an incredible story about a young man that uh, my CEO, Chris Coleman, was talking to. And we always ask, what's your favorite part of, of your new home? And this 12-year-old boy said, um, it doesn't have carpet. And Chris is like, well, that's odd. Usually I hear it's the backyard or it's this or it's that. And it's like, well, what do you mean it doesn't have carpet? And he goes, I have asthma. And there's never been a place that I've been able to live where I could breathe. And I'm going to be able to breathe in my new home. And so we see, we hear and see stories like that all the time. Um, so it, I, one of the things I wanted to mention, too, is that we, um, we often partner with cities on what we refer to as orphan lots. It's like places where no other developer would dare go in. Uh, and it, it might be locked by one thing or another. We are just wrapping up on a wonderful project up on the north side of St. Paul, where it was really one of those orphan lots where other developers had tried and weren't successful there. And Habitat is tenacious, and we just don't give up. And it took us mm -hmm. years, and it took us uh, even starting the project and stopping the project because they had uh, environmental concerns, and we remediated that with additional support from uh, the federal, county, and state, but we got the project done, and now there are 11 single-family homes created in this new neighborhood, which we're very, very proud of. And you do work in the suburbs, right? I mean, um, maybe the Hugo example might be something that you can talk about. Yeah. Let me share that. So, uh, yes, when we put our plans together, and it's changed a little bit, um, we used to think about Habitat as being 25% in St. Paul, 25% in Minneapolis, and then kind of the donut everywhere else in the suburbs, the other 50%. Given that our Habitat home buyers now have more choice and they're choosing to live wherever they want to, that's changing. And we actually are seeing more families want to and choose um, so our numbers are shifting. Um, when we get development opportunities in the suburbs, we jump on them. Uh, so for example, um, the project in Hugo, we were the beneficiary of a million dollar uh, land donation from a, a private entity. Uh, we went in and built uh, 34 units uh, in that development. It was... Um, mostly four and five plex, mostly four is we, I think we had one or two five plexes. And, um, and it was, we worked very closely with the community. Habitat uh, historically uh, has followed the other part of our, our, of our clients. Uh, we'd serve 30 to 80 percent area median income. We have followed, because most of our marketing was word of mouth, we followed immigration patterns. So 25 years ago, we might have been serving a lot of Hmong families. More recently, we were serving a lot of East and West African families. Uh, Hugo was a site that was attractive to a lot of those immigrant families. 
We worked very closely uh, with the city, uh, with the faith community, and also with um, the, the schools um, to ensure that the families that were going to be uh, moving into their neighborhood were going to be welcomed. And um, there were lots of meetings, lots of uh, uh, interactions that, um, that we, we had that happen. Um, one of the things that I'll share is that Hugo is a, is a, is a ways away. We know that. It's, it's not dissimilar to where, you know, in some cases that would be one of the furthest, you know, northeast places we might build. Victoria might be one of the furthest southwest places we would build. And um, one of the most important things was, it was uh, having the ability to have some of those families work in that community. I was at a home uh, celebration one year and met a woman who she and her son had moved into this development. She was employed at the airport. And uh, literally, I thought, how is she going to do that commute every single day? Well, fast forward a year later, I was going up to a second. I probably had other celebrations in between, but I went to another celebration and spoke to that same woman I'd spoke to the year before. And I asked her, I said, I thought about you as I was driving. Uh, Hugo's a long ways away, and I can't imagine what that commute was like for you to the airport. And she said, that is the best thing. Uh, three months after she relocated up to Hugo, um, she was able to get a job uh, as a, a healthcare aide in their local nursing home. And she said, I am now five minutes from where I work. I can participate in all of the activities and be active at my son's school. It has made the world of difference. So as Kathy outlined earlier and as others have talked about, uh, it is that uh, transportation um, and not public, and we, we hear this all the time, some of our families will have to travel, you know, one and a half to two hours on public transportation to get from their neighborhood to their jobs. And, and so we would like to see it's best for our families when there are job opportunities at livable wages that are near their home. Uh, and they can really participate and be additive to that whole community ecosystem that they want to be a part of. Great. I'm going to put out one more question and then I want to open it up for conversation. Um, Mary, uh, there's some emerging housing strategies the city should consider supporting their housing goals and some of the work that you've done in that sector. Maybe you can describe the mo modular industry and kind of what is it and how can it potentially help with some affordability or at least uh, a different product type. Great. Thanks, Kathy. Um, as we were talking about the kinds of housing that Victoria might plan for, really came to mind, uh, again, the organization that I've been working with is a company called Rise Modular, R-I-S-E Modular.com. And um, if you go to their website and go to proje the Projects tab, you can actually see projects that are... Uh, in the works, and the one that really came to mind was one that they're currently doing in uh, the city of St. Michael. And I was thinking too that um, we, we still have in some cases the old idea of what commuting means, and St. Michael is very much a case where the jobs have moved to the Anoka sand plain with the completion of, of Highway 610, and St. Michael is very close to that whole area where there you know, are thousands of jobs that have been added in the last several years. And I have to imagine with some of the growth out this way that there are some similar dynamics that are happening. So uh, the Rise Modular also does a limited amount of development and they uh, own a piece of property in the city of St. Michael and it was very much uh, working in concert with the city where the city had developed a park around a lake that was just to the east of the historic downtown area and uh, there was a piece of land uh, that has now been uh, platted and uh, marked for development uh, into four multifamily properties over the next you know, probably five or six years, immediately across the street from a Cub Foods, 
and um, as I said, a walking distance to the historic downtown, and uh, thought of some of the, the similarities here. And uh, the first project in uh, that development that's being developed is an 82 unit workforce housing unit, housing project. And it's a pretty straightforward building, uh, 82 units, it's L-shaped, um, on the adjacent property, there will be another kind of companion building that will form kind of an open-ended U when the two buildings are done. Uh, it's a range of housing from efficiencies up to three bedrooms, and it really has a number of different markets. Uh, they list uh, on their website that it's uh, partially for, quote, first-time renters, so it's those... Uh, mm -hmm. You know, those young people moving out of their uh, parents' house, maybe, but not wanting to move away from the community, as well as uh, seniors that may want to no longer live in the big house but still live in the community. So I think it's an interesting model, and uh, they are using modular construction that has allowed them to keep the price points at a little lower level. Um, just to give a very, very brief primer of what modular construction is, uh, the factory of uh, Rise Modular is located in Owatonna, Minnesota, and they are cost effectively able to deliver modules within about a, a 750 mile radius. And uh, what happens and why there are cost and time savings for modular development is that at about the same time that you're uh, digging your foundation and digging for your foundation, doing all of your site work, the construction of the modular units is happening in the factory at the same time. So instead of having a completely sequential construction period, you actually overlap the two pieces of the construction, the site work and the beginning of the construction of the modules. The way that their, um, their particular business model works, they have a, essentially an assembly line, and the, uh, modulars, the modules are set up as a six-sided box, and then they move on what are called air casters from one station to the next. And as the module moves through the factory, the box gets more and more finished, and by the time it gets to the last station, the entire interior of the units are finished. Now there may be some uh, places where if you have a larger unit, you might have two modules coming together, and when it gets to the site, a little bit of patching needs to be done, and that's all planned for and all the materials are there. But um, typically all of the cabinetry is in, light fixtures, all of the plumbing fixtures, it's sheetrocked, it's painted, and in some cases, even the appliances are installed in the factory and then trucked to the site. And um, really, most buildings can be designed to be modular friendly. Uh, you really just have to be a little more attentive of how the units line up uh, across from each other. And um, the way they're built is uh, each box has a hallway section in the middle and then a portion of a unit on either side of that hallway. Everything inside the units is finished. Everything in the hallway is uh, unfinished. And then all of the utility connections are made out into the hallway. So. Uh, heating, well, heating is typically within the unit, but um, plumbing, electrical, all comes out into the hallway and then goes to, uh, to the source for the utilities. So once the modules are on site, the remaining time to construction uh, is re really relatively short. And uh, it's estimated that anywhere between 20 and 50 percent shorter construction time for uh, modular units. So a lot of different reasons that developers may choose to go modular. One is uh, it's been fairly popular for tight urban sites where you just don't have any place to put your construction materials. 
Uh, you probably don't have that issue here. Um, but another one really is the amount, the much less time that it takes uh, to develop the project. So, uh, Debbie. Yeah. Ms. I'm curious about the, um, the workforce in conjunction with that. So most of it is happening um, at the factory. So I would think that the workforce numbers at the site would be less. I'm also curious about um, does this end up being 20% less than uh, you know, traditional construction? What's the cost savings on that? It's something that uh, folks in the industry talk about all the time. And uh, my gut feeling after having watched several projects here and projects in other part of the country is that if you're a developer doing your very first project, um, and it's a relatively smaller project, you might be even as to cost, but shorter as to your construction period. So less risk, lower uh, construction financing fees, those sorts of things, just simply because it's happening a lot faster. If you then are a developer that uh, says, hey, I kind of like that design, it worked well for me, I'm going to do a second one and a third one, then you can be looking at cost savings of probably 10 to 20 percent. So the, it's, it's a combination, I would say, of uh, some developers really like the idea of having all that fine work done in a factory controlled setting where it's climate controlled all year long. You're not having your uh, two by fours sit out in the mud waiting, uh, you know, waiting for the weather to clear. Uh, the modules are delivered to the site completely shrink wrapped and waterproofed and are only lift, the waterproofing only comes off when the crane comes, picks it up and sets it on the building and gets attached and then, and then covered. So uh, there are different reasons that a developer may choose modular. Uh, cost is certainly one, but it's really only one of several uh, factors. Councilman, are those um, market market rate developments? Uh, the the uh, project in St. Michael uh, is a market rate project, but I would say it's um, kind of in the 70 to 80 percent of median income, like Paul was talking about. It's not, it's a very nice building, but it's not a super high amenity building in St. Michael. Great, let's open it up for questions on all of the topics that we discussed. Who's gonna jump in? I guess I will. Yep. Um, and Mr. Mayor, this probably be for you. Um, we get, a lot of gets talked about the affordability and, and where, uh, it in, where pricing comes in, whether it's the land, it's materials, it's fees, it's this, that. Um, one of the things that I have a question on is the, of the communities that have been hit by housing first, have they, have you, has the developing industry seen reductions after they've taken the fees down uh, that they, that the, that housing first is seeking to reduce or is the developer just kind of pocketing the difference between those fees? Uh, um, and I mean, that's what, that's kind of what I see. I don't really see, I haven't heard, uh, we continue to hear how costs are rising uh, on how, on housing and, uh, communities that are being hit by the housing first uh, issue uh, it don't seem to be seeing a reduction in their housing costs. So I think um, in in any conversation that you would have uh, could have with a private developer who is seeking um, any type of uh, assistance from you is to make sure that you have access to the actual uh, development documents that they're po putting together ask them to share with you their pro forma that they're putting together and to try to understand what type of return on that cost that they are seeking to achieve on that. So meaning ask the developer to open up the books and in so doing you will be able to understand really if they are translating the subsidies that are being asked for into tangible reductions in rents. And so uh, there is, a, and I guess that, that gets to one of the, the, the 
discussion points about the public-private partnership. I mean, it's a two-way street, and 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 in it. And the, the developers need to be open and candid and transparent with the city as the cities need to be open and transparent with the developers about what is possible. And so um, it, it's, hard to, it, it's hard to pocket uh, the, the, the savings, if you will, in that people have, uh, developers have a, a return threshold that they're trying to achieve. And, and the for-profit developers are trying to create value um, but it's a balancing act between what is the right number and what is fair and what is achievable. Because at the end of the day, the rents still have to pencil out to be attractive to the marketplace as has been determined. So uh, I, I've not heard of that in terms of sort of individuals or groups um, uh, pocketing the difference, but you can always uh, validate that by asking folks to be transparent about what they're trying to achieve. You had suggested a housing study, and, I, and I, I'm pretty sure we have done one of those. Yeah. It probably needs some updating, but I know we've done that. When we kind of identify what our gap is, in your experience, how much of that is rental and how much of that should be um, owned properties? So I don't have a basis of comparison for what, what should be one or the other. Uh, but a healthy mixture of of those types of, of rental and ownership, I think, are, are crucial to the community. Um, again, the, what, what is the what can the market support, and what what are the price points at which those products would be? And I call them products, but uh, mm -hmm. you know the, those 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 housing options uh, can be accepted in in the marketplace. One of the challenges, uh, at least in, the, in sort of the entry level housing, single family housing market right now, is not everybody can qualify or come up with the appropriate down payment to acquire a home. And as a result of that, there has now been somewhat of a, a, a proliferation or the beginning stages of essentially subdivisions for rent. Uh, there is a, uh, there are a number of groups that are out building subdivisions and renting them out on an individual basis and those are they are attracting first-time renters or first-time I shouldn't say first-time renters they're, they're attracting households that are in their early formation stages and starting out with young families and they just don't quite have the nest egg yet to put uh, to place a down payment on a, a for sale home they're also attracting seniors who want to be near um, in, near the kids, so that's that's one concept that is emerging in the marketplace. That is, it, it's rental. It looks like ownership, but it's really a rental model. I, you know, I think from the the home ownership perspective, other than the the, the, the habitat model, you know, entry level homes in the three hundred to four hundred thousand dollar range, it's getting tougher and tougher to create those options. So. You know, well, and even for us, I agree, it's tough for us because we actually, um, when we value our houses, they're actually a market rate value. Um, and so these increases in housing production and uh, and as we've seen housing um, in, just increase overall, uh, that further uh, widens that affordability gap for our families. So again, you know, need for... Uh, government assistance and also needs uh, for philanthropy to fill that gap. But uh, even though Habitat may be able to build a house for $250,000, if we're building it in uh, Victoria, it could get appraised out at a much higher value, and that is the value of the house, and that's that's what we have to um, align uh, that mortgage to and then that, that affordability gap. So we, we run into those headwinds all the time. And in answer to your question, the housing studies that I've seen um, do really call out um, kind of what the demand might be for single f for uh, ownership and for rental, and then will often also be tiered in terms of what the demand might be for uh, different levels of income. So it really uh, communities. You know, I think of uh, Rochester, for example, as a community that. Um, when uh, Destination Medical Center began to uh, do its development, 
uh, did a housing study and it really, really helped the city leaders to be able to articulate to their um, public officials, uh, to philanthropy, et cetera, to say, this is how much housing we actually need to have. And let's work together and figure out how we're going to get there. How are we, you know, are, what are the tools we're going to put in place? Who do we need to attract as developers? Who do we need to attract as lenders so that we can realize um, this vision that we've sketched out? Mary, real quick, while you're on that topic of tools, I mean, I think tax increment financing is a tool that you all are familiar with, but are the, there's some emerging new tools for um, cities in particular to housing? And maybe you could talk about that, I think, maybe housing trust funds or other things. Um, yes, and uh, housing trust funds are certainly one that have uh, gotten a lot of attention uh, just in the last couple of years. And just uh, the Minnesota Housing Partnership is a place to look uh, it's uh, MN, mhponline.org is their um, uh, website. Uh, what, what they cite is that there are over 770 city, county, and state housing trust funds all over the country. They're really pretty common, and uh, they usually come from some sort of usually very small dedication of some revenue source in uh, the city or the county, wherever you're working, that generates a regular flow of revenue. And what it does then is creates a pool of money that you have control over that's dedicated to housing that you can then use to kind of direct the projects that you want to see in your community. And, um, uh, just one example, the city of Red Wing uh, has had a housing trust fund now since 2015, and they maximize their HRA levy, and they now have a flow of about $100,000 a year from that source that they can use to really influence and make sure that the kind of housing that needs a little boost um, is something where they can have a say. Because if you've got some money, you get more of a vote <laughs> than if you're expecting a developer uh, to come up with whatever uh, gap resources they may need. Also, there has been um, proposed legislation uh, for the last several years for a matching fund for local housing trust funds. It got a lot of traction this year. I think a little bit of funding, yeah, not as much approved. as... I don't know in some funding. Yep. And so that's uh, another potentially an incentive for communities uh, to take a fresh look at housing trust funds and maybe do the groundwork now with the promise of some uh, the potentially matching funds that would help you boost that. And it, you know, it takes a while because it's a revenue generated fund uh, to actually have some walking around money to uh, uh, to use to attract housing, so starting sooner rather than later on a tool like that is uh, is probably helpful. For single family homes, is there an average square, square footage uh, that you're looking at, or are you fitting the community's average size? The one thing that I've I asked our city manager and being on the planning commission still. Uh, six, eight, seven years later don't understand why we have a minimum square footage uh, in our ordinance, um, but we do. And so would it make sense if we wanted smaller homes uh, and reduced cost homes to have smaller square footage written into our ordinances um, to be able to build those types of homes that would, to me, be more affordable? Uh, is that what you're seeing in the market or is that what you build typically or do you stick to a community's uh, lot size and, and square footage size? So I'll jump in here. Um, yeah, so we do both. Um, when Habitat is building in any community, whether it's um, kind of those land use standards, uh, we obviously follow them. 
uh, but also design. So if we're building in Cottage Grove or Woodbury, that home is going to look very different than it's going to look uh, in a core city. We build differently in St. Paul versus Minneapolis, depending on, on the neighborhood that we're building in. Our homes are typically around 2,000 square feet, give or take, um, you know, 200 square feet. Uh, we tend to build, and we're, we're listening more and more uh, to our families and what their needs are. Uh, again, immigrant families tended to need larger homes. They had multi-generations in that home. So they were taking in uh, some of those homes, uh, four and five bedroom homes, were housing uh, up to nine, 10, 11, 12 people in those homes. Uh, when we are talking now with, um, and we have a very strong focus on closing the racial gap in housing, when we're talking to first-time home buyers in the African-American community, a single mom with one or two kids might want something a lot smaller. So we are, we are going to listen to those needs and build to that. But definitely, when I talk to our land use folks, um, you know, in, in preparation for this, you know, one of, one of their comments was that, um, you know, right now uh, it's expensive lands and very large lot sizes, uh, so not a lot of density. Uh, and that's creating high values uh, in your community and, um, and there, therefore high property taxes along with that. So that's harder for us to go in and to, and to build something like that. So we would definitely welcome uh, higher density, smaller lot sizes, and a smaller footprint for that home. Yeah, we have also looked at that uh, just to, again to try and create a product that is in the you know two hundred fifty thousand dollar range, which sounds absurd, but there you are. Uh, and we were looking at uh, we did a project that we uh, it, it hadn't quite gotten off the ground here, but um, it, you know five hundred and eight hundred square foot houses. So again, that's probably below your minimum. Uh, but that's essentially a one-bedroom house or a two-bedroom house. One of the one of the things we did run into is, despite the fact that, and sort of a tip, just to give you a kind of a point of reference, a typical build for us is sort of 15, 1,600 square feet, sort of three bedrooms, two and a quarter baths, or something like that. Uh, modest house, but but kind of in that range. Um, so what we said is, let's you know, let's see if we can kind of dial that down. Um, and what we found was that our cost, instead of sort of going from, you know, in half, basically, went more like in three quarters, because you still had the foundation, you've still got the, uh, uh, the kitchen, you've still got the bathrooms, you've still got sort of all the expensive parts of the house that you have to keep in there, um, and you've kind of eliminated a lot of the, the dumb or the cheap square footage, if you will, bedrooms or, or you know, just kind of larger areas. So. It, it, we did find that you know there's there's definitely a drop in it, and um, and it, it felt like kind of a you know uh, a good approach. Um, one of the other things that we had kind of looked at doing um, in addition to that was doing them at 16 feet wide. So then then I can go talk to Mary and the people over at Rise and say, hey, why don't you just they can just bring one out on a truck and just set it down on the uh, uh, on the uh, you know, on the foundation, which I thought, wow, that's a great, you know, that's a great idea. Um, or you could do a series of townhouses or kind of row houses, you know, if you think of Baltimore or, or you know, Washington, D.C. or something, it looks a little more urban, uh, those are, but it, basically it's, you know, kind of one next to the other, next to the other. And then, you know, you have the double party wall already because you've got the, the modules and the rest. And so we've been kind of uh, um, looking at that. We haven't got had one built yet, but I think, you know, to the extent that, you know, there's a way to, you know, we definitely would need the regulatory uh, part of it to work. And, and the one we looked at was in Minneapolis, and they were open to it. They said, sure, we can do that. We'll do it as a planned unit development, do your, you know, 11 here and, uh, and do that. So, uh, but you do need to, you know, to, you have to kind of clear the way for that to, to happen. But I, I think that's a really interesting market because then you've got, um, weirdly, Minneapolis, uh, just to, to give you a sense, 81% of the households in Minneapolis are three people or less. So you, we don't need the, the, you know, Minneapolis, you don't need the big houses. But I, I would be willing to, to venture that, again, out in your market, again, you're going to have some small small families. You're going to have the people that are a couple, a single person, that would like to own but, but can't because, uh, you know, because sort of everything that's being built is kind of in that at least 1,500 square feet and probably probably bigger is my guess. I don't, I don't know exactly what your typical stuff is. So there, there's, there's a way forward on that one, I think, uh, but probably takes a little more work. 
Changing gears to um, rental again, um, everything that's been written lately as, as recently as yesterday about rent controls in the bigger cities um, has been written from the developer's standpoint and how they, they'll want to do business and how they'll they, the, the, they compete with the suburbs. However, from my standpoint, from our standpoint, we'd be looking at uh, renters uh, wanting to stay in the inner cities because their rents aren't going to go up as much as they might out here. Is that been something that's been considered uh, that where you're looking at not just the developer but the renter standpoint where cities that are developing like Victoria, we're now competing with Minneapolis where rents are going to not go up as much as they could out here um, because we just don't have it. I mean, that's the biggest rental building we have in, in the city. Um, and so, I, you know, I'm just concerned that we're not going to be able to attract uh, the renters if we do build something. Is that something that's been given thought about? Thoughts? The I'll, I'll just jump in. First of all, in, in Minneapolis right now, the charter that was just passed allowed the city council to create or to take a look at a rent control policy. So that is yet to be developed. Uh, but if you read the stories about St. Paul, it is one of the most restrictive uh, uh, throughout the country. I think the, the fear right now amongst renters and the renters that I have talked about is that they're concerned that they're going to see huge uh, jumps before that ordinance takes effect. Uh, and then after that, it would stabilize, but it's going to force a lot of people out of their rent. I have a number of, of, of renter friends that have expressed that concern to me uh, who live over in St. Paul. Minneapolis has some time to develop uh, what policy they think works, um, or to be honest with you, the uh, city council and the mayor could choose uh, not to uh, advance a rent control ordinance also. Would you see those people going into single family or going just elsewhere to rent uh, that are that maybe have that fear of uh, getting hit with a higher rent before the rent control gets Put in. It's always an issue with our families in terms of we see so many families uh, seeking out affordable home ownership because once you're locked in, you are locked in. And, uh, you know, our families could have a lot of economic improvement in their in their lives. We hope they do. We hope that Stable House has provided that opportunity. Their uh, mortgage payment will not change. And um, so, yes, I mean, this could, in fact, cause us to have more opportunity for that first time home buyer. Uh, we need, Habitat always has been a supporter of a healthy continuum of housing. You know, we participate and want to see the end of homelessness in, our, in our, all of our communities. We want and need to see a healthy uh, subsidized rental market. There have to be enough units for those families and they have to be stable. There needs to be enough market rate. There needs to be enough, uh, you know, affordable homeownership. There needs to be enough market because we need to have people be able to move through that housing continuum uh, as their needs change. And there has to be availability. Uh, we have a number of developers on our board um, that did express a lot of concern about um, p pending projects that they had uh, in the market rate rental arena, uh, some affordable. Uh, that they really needed to take a pause and reassess. And, and we have concerns. I think all of us at this table tonight believe there needs to be more production. There needs to be more production across that entire continuum to keep it healthy. And that's just, that may not happen until people can really assess what, this, what these um, changes mean. I actually, if I could weigh in for a yeah, second here, um, I actually think it's going to be to your benefit. Um, I, think, I think if I'm a developer, um, I'm going to go, am I going to St. Paul where I can only make 3% a year? No, I'm probably not going to do that. So that means somewhere else. And if, it's, if Minneapolis is doing the same thing, that's going to mean somewhere else. And so it's going to, I think the first ring suburbs are already sort of seeing, you know, Bloomington, places like that, again, where there's land and, um, and you're still, you know, kind of on the, you know, uh, on the bus route and the rest. I think, uh, you know, I think those, that's where, that's where the development and energy will go. So in a way, it's, uh, I guess I would say indirectly, it will, it will benefit you because it's going to make it, it's going to make development less attractive um, in, in the city of St. Paul. 
And I just say that, you know, I work for a nonprofit agency. We're all about rent control. <laughs> you know, our rents are tied to people's income. So, um, you know, it, it, it really, it, it, you know, it doesn't, you know, it, it doesn't affect us in the slightest, I guess I would say. But, and, and again, I'm kind of personally motivated by keeping people's rents low and keeping their housing affordable. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, just if I think about the, the grander universe and, and uh, you know, my other colleagues in development, I mean, they, they have to, it has to make sense for them economically to do it. And, and that's going to be tougher, tougher sledding in, in St. Paul. Yeah, so. I read that they, the developers were putting holds on things because of it. So that's not going to, want to come out here. That's not going to solve our production problems. Commissioner no. Moore. Um, I just have a very quick question. Um, and it applies more to apartments and townhouses. Uh, and this is to any of you to answer. How is the unit count established? Like, what's the sweet spot? Um, obviously, there's a lot of variables, and so certainly cities kind of dictate some of that, a good amount of that. But, um, you know, you touched a little bit of this earlier, Chris, um, about, you know, with density that, that creates more affordability. Is there any type of um, formula that helps you determine this? Sure, I'm, I, I'll keep talking. Uh, um, uh, 100 units is a nice size, and, I'll, uh, and for uh, several reasons. And one, I would say, at least on the rental, for the rental uh, piece, but 100 units is a nice size because basically you can rent. You can have at that point you can afford to have one site manager and one maintenance person. So maybe 100, 125. You're you know you're going to start taxing people once you get past that. Um, but that's why you see things that are done that are 250 or 300 units because, again, you, you have that economy of scale. Uh, but, but really, to get to kind of one person, you know, one maintenance person, one uh, property manager, 100 is a really nice number. Um, interestingly, 80 is a nice number if you just want one elevator. So if you want to try and make your building a little cheaper, you could go 80 or 90 and just keep it to one elevator. So you might be kind of inclined to sneak that down, but, but then that's tends to irk people because you only have one elevator and to wait for it and if it breaks, you're in bad shape. But so I would say just as a rule of thumb, you know, a hundred is a hundred is a number that, that you know works well for most developers. You get smaller than that, you have less efficiency on your maintenance, your operations become more expensive, um, et cetera, et cetera. I I'll be really interested to see just personally how all the single family rental works because e either you got to have everybody mow their own lawn or you got to go out and mow 100 lawns for 100 units instead of one and and that just feels like a disaster waiting to happen i'm sorry you know there's a i'm How sure there's a work? model for yeah, it no no that that, that <laughs> but, is that is the that that is the yeah. way that those communities are actually being operated they're actually operated as if the the, the manager of the community is acting like a homeowners association yeah. where they are maintaining the streets they're maintaining the sidewalks the landscaping they've actually set up the the homes themselves so that a maintenance individual can come in from the outside to an outside door to change out furnace filters, et cetera, so that you're not intruding gotcha. on the individual. So, it, 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 the, but the economy of scale is really important on that, just so that you can spread the cost out over a, a larger number of, of, of units. If I can just touch on uh, your question about how do you get to the if I heard that correctly, how do you both unit size as well as the individual mix right. of the of the communities? This is where the mar this is where a market study would be really handy in terms of identifying, you know, what are the what are the the perceived needs of the of, of the population of that community and the growing population of that community. Again, it's kind of a math problem that is being solved because. Many people like two-bedroom units of a certain size that will generate a certain uh, uh, rent for that unit, which translates to a rent per square foot. The smaller units, the one-bedroom units, are more uh, apt to generate a higher rent per square foot, as are the studios apt to generate a higher rent per square foot. So, you know, a, a, a pure mercenary developer is going to say, well, I'm going to build nothing but studios. Well, that's not what the marketplace would call for. So, it, again, it, it, it depends on, you know, what audience are you serving? Are there a lot of couples? Are there a lot of college students? Are there a lot of um, 
um, uh, 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 general uh, professional uh, uh, workers in your area and what is the propensity of the type of unit that they want. So that's what tends to influence the balance and the mix of the units within the community. I think your other question was what metric or what, what can be communicated to the development community about how much you can get on a site. Well, yes. However, you know, with the lens and the filter of making sure affordability is accomplished and market rate is accomplished. So, so am I understanding it correctly that your developer hat is on first and foremost to solve for market um, demands and then all the affordability kind of comes second? I think it depends on the nature of the, of, of the project. And if we're talking about, say, a, um, a brand new uh, workforce housing project or uh, complex that is, 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 is nice, has a certain level of finish and amenities to it, but is not over, uh, over amenitized, that objective is to try to keep the rents as affordable as possible. So, you know, again, it's trying to squeeze out cost as much as can be squeezed out. And whether that is through actually building efficient buildings like a modular home or getting some measure of public assistance to help buy down that overall cost, again, that particular project type would would be one that would be geared towards keeping it as affordable as possible. And from a developer standpoint, the more affordable uh, the, the community is, the more likely it is you're always going to keep it full. So from a developer perspective, I mean, full buildings are, 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 are way better than buildings that have a lot of turnover and expense and maintenance with preparing a unit for rent again, even though you could, you know, theoretically what people are doing is trying to capture the increase in the rents in the market um, uh, in, in that instance. So. Again, in describing that type of building, affordability is, is, is the driving factor from a market perspective. I would just add one other comment in terms of uh, Chris's comments about building size. Um, one other thing to think about as you're thinking about the various places in Victoria where you might uh, look to have multifamily housing developed, um, also think about the campus approach so I mentioned the uh, property in St. Michael where the building they're building right now is 82 units, but there'll be a mirror image of that. So that's really 164 units. So you'll be able to leverage a single manager for both of those buildings. And where you have the luxury of more land, which often the inner ring suburbs uh, and the cities won't have, you can think in those terms. And one of the things I'm sure Chris can give some examples that can work for communities is to uh, have a campus approach where one of the buildings is a market rate building and one of the buildings is affordable and really looking at them as paired or you know even more buildings than that so that it can attract a mix of incomes but within a single site. Yeah, just the Ford site is a good example of, of something that we're doing. Um, you know, kind of the old Ford site in St. Paul, uh, 170 acres or so. Um, the city kind of redeveloped the whole thing. You've got parks, you've got infrastructure, and then you have a X amount of for sale, X amount of uh, essentially market rate rental, X amount of senior, and X amount of affordable, which is where I come in. And um, uh, and they've kind of you know, mapped out the whole way to do that. They also set up the finances in such a way that they were able to, to kind of do that and provide the TIF that we need to do the affordable kind of on the, on the back, on the piggyback uh, on the, uh, you know, on the uh, market rate projects that are going in there. So um, yeah, that's, that's a good example, I think. Um, I would also encourage you to think about what you want the city to feel like, because if, if you think about the, um, the market or where do people want to live, and walkable communities is a very big deal now. And I think, uh, I think you guys have just, I mean, I just throw around a little bit. It's very cool down here. You know, you've got just, uh, you got, you know, the lake is here. You've got bike paths. You've got this new building, which is really cool. You've got places to eat and, and drink and everything. And it's, you know, and if you could just get more, you know, more people in there, that would, again, help your businesses, but also kind of creates that walkable community. And I think, you know, if you just kind of imagine 
where you'd like to go as a as a community. I think that's that's of course flies in the face of the idea that you're going to do the large one with everybody in it. But uh, but you know, kind of filling in some of your uh, you know kind of areas down here, I think I think could really be done, and I think it would I think it would add to sort of your downtown that becomes the more affordable stuff probably by its nature. And, and you can kind of drive those if that's if that's something that that is a city or you know you're interested in. I noticed you had a couple of surface parking lots, and of course, that's just to me screams I want a building here. But uh, you know that's just the way I am too. My wife accuses me of wanting to build stuff on every square inch. So um, anyway, so Chris, based on what you see in your experience, are there things that were lacking in the city in order to attract those that affordable housing population? As you, as you drove by, I know you haven't. I don't think so. I'm, I'm going to guess, just from your from the little bit I know about your demographic, that probably the people that work in your city are coming from somewhere else. They live. They actually yeah. can't afford to live here. And, and that might be part of the, the housing study that Mary kind of alluded to, which is to see you know, how many folks there are kind of in that bucket. And is that something that you want to try and provide you know, so that you have kind of a full range of people can live, eat, work, play in their same spot, right? <laughs> and that, that feels like a good, you know, kind of a sustainable um, model for a city, if you will. Um, and so, so that, I, so I think the affordability is, is part of it. Um, and I think that you have the flip of that too, where you have a lot of people that live here that work somewhere else, right? And so, um, you know, my guess is, um, you know, again, if there's, if there's a way you can, you know, kind of generate jobs and, and opportunities for people to live, you know, kind of locally. I think that's, that's really helpful. And I do feel like, um, this is in my observation here, um, you know, really successful place, places, if you will, are, are things that have kind of all of those, you know, where I can go down, you know, I can go have a beer with my buddies here. I can go over and, you know, I can take my kids to school and it's close by. I can, you know, I can go for a bike ride, you know, just do all, of, you know, all of those things kind of locally people love to do it. I, I think um, most people don't really enjoy getting in their car to go 50 miles to do something like that. Um, I don't know, maybe, you know, I'm speaking for myself here, but I think, I think um, if you look at, um, you know, um, walkable cities, um, you know, one of the things is, um, you know, it, actually it will increase your land values. So if you can make more, more density, if you make a, a place that people want to come to, that's very important. And and that, well, that will drive up your values much, you know, much more so than if you just provide a, a spot for people to live. Um, so and then also just in terms of people's health too, if you can get them, if you can get people out walking and riding bike and doing things like that, um, just just much better for their health. So it's better for the health of the citizens of your uh, city as well. So there's just a number of reasons to kind of just sort of think holistically about you know about what does you know what does victoria want to be because i think you have a you have a cool little downtown you have little stuff like this already going this is a really neat building you got the library in here you know i i love going to the library with my boys so you know i, I just i just encourage you to to kind of um think about that as well as uh, and have affordability work into that uh but think about what your city wants to be and to i'm sorry to jump on that just a second i think uh, tapping into the regional council of mayors mm -hmm. and really finding a couple of cities that have been successful in attracting uh, multifamily housing to revitalize their downtowns or to grow their downtowns. And uh, you know, places that come to mind are places like Elk River, mm -hmm. where I, I just happened to drive through there the other day, where you know there's a tremendous amount of of housing there now that wasn't there five years ago. So that kind of thinking of nodes within the city that might lend themselves to that kind of a holistic, you know, downtownish feel uh, makes sense. It's a little bit of your chicken and egg thing again, too. Like, I want to live near the Starbucks, but the, but the Starbucks isn't going to be there until you get enough people living there. So um, we're, you're yeah, back to that, that old problem again. <laughs> but. Uh, uh, but I just just encourage you to think about think about they can live Lord. near Ruby's Roost. No, okay. House Member Roberts. So um, we've you, you, we've talked about a lot of tools that are out there, right, to help get us affordable housing. Um, so when I was looking at our packet, right, one of the things in there was a glossary of terms and stuff like that, and one of them was um, a, uh, 
naturally occurring affordable housing, right? And I that made me think of a opinion piece or an article or whatever you want to call it I read a month or so ago and this person basically opined that because of land costs and building costs that basically the only way to get affordable housing is just to build more housing and wait <laughs> right so and no one really likes that answer right because it takes time um, I guess how much does that play in right like I mean should we be even just be right not building you know this uber um, uh, apartments with or townhomes or whatever with lots of utility or um, amenities that are high expensive but you know maybe they're not as low housing that as we would like but they're there but you know 10 years from now they're gonna you know because naturally they're not the new kid on the block anymore and they're not going to get the same rent that they got 10 years ago how how much does that play in are you i mean I, I approach this from the fundamental belief that we simply have a structural imbalance in supply and demand in our country. And it was exacerbated by the Great Recession of 10 years ago. And we are simply eking back to the long-term national averages that we had in production of both single-family and market-rate housing. And so that gap between 09 and just really back to today, it, it, we're still, I don't know if we can even build our way out of it in a timely fashion. So I look at it as uh, yes, yes, yes. It's a, a solving, solving the problem will take a, it will take all the Victorias of the Twin Cities doing somewhat the same thing in helping to expand the supply of housing and to the extent that the existing naturally occurring affordable housing can be preserved, um, it, it's all part of the solution. The, the NOAA, as it's described, it's kind of interesting. We have encountered um, in, in our work uh, some investors that are more philanthropically minded and they are willing to consider acquiring existing housing and keep it affordable. That fulfills their personal philanthropic missions. They're happy with a modest rate of return on their investment, but their goal is not to buy it. And that's one of the challenges in today's world with the NOAA housing is that market rate developers are finding an underutilized or, or, or a, a property that has a higher and better use in terms of gentrifying that building and improving it and then increasing the rents and thus displacing people that heretofore had lived there. Um, there is an emerging ESG, environmental social governance wave of investors out there that are also looking at the housing industry. How to encourage those folks to look at uh, more uh, naturally occurring housing and preserving it? I mean, I, it's, it's, it's evolutionary. Uh, frankly, and so all of this, all of this is going to knit together to help solve the challenge. And unfortunately, there isn't any silver bullet as I see it to to solve it. And unfortunately, it's going to take time. So, my I think my this is a long-winded answer to say if you have somebody that wants to build a luxury project, yes. If you have an affordable opportunity, yes. If you have a townhome project, yes. The challenge will be how do you integrate that in with your existing community and what drew people out here in the first place? Because I think I drew them out here. I mean, there is Victoria has a bucolic nature to it, and maybe a lot of people moved here because they like that. And to the extent it becomes more densified, that'll be a challenge that you as a council will have to navigate. To add to that, you know, many cities have the affordable housing component in any new construction project and that makes a project from a developer's standpoint much more expensive and sometimes not feasible and so what's the outcome less units being built less development so it's a fine balance you, you do need more stuff I would just I would just agree with Paul I would say yeah all any types of production are good we're, we're you know we're really lacking the number of houses for the number of people so you know any anything you can get built is a good idea 
the, the thing that's the problem with the DOA thing that I, I would uh, just to give you a kind of a, uh, a little more expansion of that. Um, so if you could buy a unit, a NOAA, a NOAA unit, let's say it was built in the 60s, I can buy, a, you know, I can buy that for $100,000 or $125,000. I can put in $40,000. I've suddenly got a unit for $150,000 or $175,000. If I build a new unit, it's two fifty. So here you go. I just that's why you know. So you're really you're going to be fighting the market a bit on that one. Um, but Paul's philanthropic people aside, there are a lot of people out there that aren't quite so philanthropic. No, no, I, I, <laughs> and, and, and are, are running are running right at that stuff and going, look, I can't you know uh, you know shooting fish in a barrel you know because I'm, I'm you know I've now got a you know I've now got a unit that's one hundred fifty thousand dollars that looks pretty much like the the other one. Um, not quite as swanky, maybe, and not quite as new, but functional, but functional, but perfect and perfectly nice. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna knock fifty bucks off your rent. So, ba bing, what's not to like? So um, that you know, there's just a lot of that. So you will be, you know, in attempting to preserve that, you are kind of working against the market forces on that one. Um, so that's just, I just put that out there for your consideration. So one other thing, I just so, make, so, oh yeah, go ahead, Chris Pye, yeah. and you had said kind of like. Any building is good. Um, do you believe that if it's if it's all luxury building that that's still a positive? So here's what'll happen: the luxury market will get filled up. It's already starting to happen, right? And then some of that stuff that was luxury stuff is going to go down, move down here to something I can afford, right? And then and that and that will happen, as as Paul described. It's going to take time for that to happen, but I think uh, eventually, you know, on the market on the on the um, on the luxury side, you're going to hit the bottom of the pool. You're going to you're going to build one for everybody that's going to pay two thousand dollars a month rent. Pretty soon, you've got a unit for all those folks, and and but the unit's still there now. And suddenly, okay, maybe somebody's not going to pay. I'm going down to eighteen fifty now. So it, it does sort of work it into the market in that way. Um, what what I'm concerned about actually would be kind of from a new perspective, is that you need to make a fairly hefty rent just to build the building, and that's what I'm worried about. It's just um, I, you know, I, I can't afford to. I need to rent it to somebody for two thousand dollars in order for me to kind of, uh, you know, pay the rent, pay pay the uh, the finance people, um, get a reasonable return on it. You know, for in other words, for the market to work, you know, I, I need to charge that two thousand dollars rent. And what I'm worried about is we don't have that many people that can afford that. And eventually, all of them will get something. And then I feel like what will happen is we'll stop. Then I'm not going to build anything anymore because it doesn't work for me financially anymore. And so that will be an interesting moment, I think. Um, Let me just add, too, on the kind of single-family NOAA strategy, which Habitat is becoming very active in. And um, that is housing that, again, as Paul mentioned 10 and 12 years ago, uh, with the foreclosure crisis, uh, many, many uh, single-family homes were bought up by investors. Uh, those investors have cash flowed those uh, properties uh, well. Some have been maintained well. Some others have not. Uh, and Habitat, and again, I don't think this is an is issue for Victoria, but it is something to think about in terms of the whole ecosystem, where um, we are now interested in purchasing those uh, investor-owned single-family homes, they're scattered sites, uh, and then working uh, with those renters to convert them into um, homeowners um, so that they then have that stability of that. And we're not, we're not having to produce another expensive unit. The unit already exists, but we can convert that. We have a very interesting pilot going on right now with um, Dakota County, where they have um, 64 scattered single family housing units that each have a section eight uh, voucher associated with them. Um, again, as those units become available and we have about 10 of those 64 that are available now, we're going in putting in some modest rehab. Uh, we paid market rate, it's a HUD program, we had to pay the market rate for those homes. Uh, but then again, we will qualify people, uh, they're vacant, so we'll qualify new Dakota County residents to occupy those houses Further on in the pilot, we will again work with the renters that are in that uh, in that situation. So again, we are maintaining that affordability in those single-family houses over the long term because they've now got a 30-year mortgage on them. 
uh, it's really good in, in Dakota County because uh, we have freed up that Section 8 voucher that then can be used. Dakota County would prefer to get into some more uh, more dense housing, so it, it frees those vouchers up um, to accommodate that. So we really look at that particular, and we really refer to it as a, as a NOAA strategy on the single family space to be able to either buy those types of properties or those investor owns and convert them over to home ownership. Mayor, I think we yeah, went we're over running our up time, again. so thank you so much. Yes, we're running up against the clock, so thank you so much to all of our panelists and all of the council and commission, commissioners this evening. It's been a great conversation and has given us a ton to think about. So. So, Mayor, I will be following up with a with a summary memo, and I will also send staff a link to a just a very quick survey, and they'll send it out to all of you. And I would really appreciate your feedback. And so, thanks for hosting us. And Terrific. Thank thanks you to so the much. panel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. There are no more items to come before the. Uh, yeah. Oh. Likewise. Oh, I'm sorry. Please. They look the right? Yeah. Well, you know, they were. No. Jim Carino says hi. The owner is just here. Finish the year, and he said no. Why don't you come on? Go ahead and um, state your name for the record and proceed. Thank you. Um, Mayor and Council Members, uh, thank Tell you for having us tonight. My name is Allison Strike. I'm the Deputy Director for the Carver County CDA. Um, where am I pointing? <laughs> there we go. <laughs> um, I did want to quick make a, a super quick correction. So I said in the uh, last five years, only four developments had been funded through Minnesota Housing, or three, and it's actually four. Um, the last project is called West Creek Apartments, and that is going to be, um, they'll be closing and breaking ground early next spring. It's 18 units in Chaska, and it's 100% permanent supportive housing. Mm. Um, so the mission of the CDA is to provide affordable housing and foster community and economic development. Um, some of our key roles are affordable and workforce housing, support services, uh, community economic development, and we collaborate and partner. Um, I'm not going to go over any of the housing terminology. I know we have a short time and I want to get to some specific projects that will show you some examples of what you were talking with the panel. Um, so why affordable and life cycle housing? I don't need to read the bullets for you. Um, but we talk, talked a lot about that affordable, um, affordable and what that means. And so by HUD's definition, affordability really means paying no more than 30% of your income on your housing expenses. And so by that definition, there's really no, that applies to anybody at any income limit. Um, but generally when you hear like the CDA and, and panelists talk about affordable housing, we're really talking about housing that's targeting lower income, 30, 40, 50, 60, 80 percent of area median income households. Um, and I will give you an example uh, later on of one of our projects that will talk about those different affordability levels and how what it really took to pull a deal together. Um, and some of those affordability, um, like the panelists mentioned, there's the low income housing tax credit with a minimum of 15 years. Um, but Minnesota Housing, you, you ask how you get these projects funded. Developers are always, we will do anything to get points because it's so competitive. And so right now you can go up to 40 years and that will get you extra points with Minnesota Housing if you agree to keep that affordability for longer. Um, and then obviously TIF is dependent on the TIF dif district and then there's some restrictive covenants. Um, these are just some common tools, policies, and financing to support um, affordable housing. And then I'll give you a few examples of some cities that are doing them if anybody's interested in looking into those. Um, so accessory dwelling units, um, Crystal has a policy around those. Uh, Minnesota Housing, the CDA has been funded. Some of those other projects I mentioned were Ron Clark Construction and MWF. Um, TIF and abatement, the city of Chanhassen's done some recently. Uh, inclusion, inclusionary housing and mixed income, um, St. Louis Park, Minnetonka, and Bloomington all have policies if you're interested in those. Um, fee waivers in Carver County, both Waconia and Watertown have a fee a sewer and um, water trunk fee waiver program. Um, livable communities recently, Chaska, Norwich, Young America, 
And then the CDA has the Community Growth Partnership Initiative, which is a grant program cities can apply for, and affordable housing is a component of that. And Carver, Chanhassen, and Maconia have all received funding recently for that. And then I'm going to have Elise come up and talk about home ownership. Good evening. I'm Elise Durbin. Uh, I'm the Director of Community and Economic Development for the CDA. I'm going to talk more on the home ownership side. Uh, just different types of, of home ownership. You have single family attached units, such as townhomes. You also have condominiums. That's another uh, home ownership type. Uh, when we talk about affordability, we're talking anywhere. Uh, the affordability levels at 60% AMI, 80%, and 120%. And length of affordability. With restrictive covenants uh, by state statute, that maximum length of affordability is 30 years. But we'll talk a little bit later about land trust. You can have a maximum affordability of 99 years. And then home ownership tools. A lot of the panel uh, talked about some of these particular tools. Uh, TIF, uh, Allison mentioned inclusionary housing and mixed income. Uh, community land trust, we'll talk about the CDA running the community land trust in a little bit. Employer assisted housing, EDA and HRA levies, which can provide an infusion into housing trust fund uh, money. And then housing improvement areas also help to um, not develop necessarily affordable home ownership, but uh, they help to maintain that affordable home ownership. Uh, the Met Council Affordable Housing Goals, I'm sure you've all talked about this. You see those levels um, of need as to what uh, Victoria is expected to add over the next 10 years as far as affordable home ownership. And these goals are set every 10 years by the Met Council as part of that land, Metropolitan Land Planning Act. And then impact on affordability. Again, the panel talked a lot about the impact of affordability density. So by having uh, smaller lot sizes, you can add more homes, which adds to that density and lowering that income of um, maybe on those particular lots. Uh, fees, we talked a little bit about SAC and WAC fees. Uh, zoning code, I think Councilmember Gunderson, you talked a little bit about that zoning code and what that can do to provide affordable housing. Um, you know, things that we're seeing in other communities, maybe not necessarily making a garage a requirement. Uh, those uh, particular unit sizes or allowing for accessory dwelling units is another opportunity to provide affordable home ownership or proof of parking and we'll talk a little bit about uh, how that's played into one of our particular developments. Affordability covenants and inclusionary zoning. Maybe a developer comes in and they want to provide affordable housing or excuse me, they just want to do a development, a market rate development, but you as a city saying, no, we want maybe 10% affordable housing units uh, to be a part of, of this. And so requiring that developer, if they're asking for something from you, maybe a zoning change, maybe a land use plan change, helping, holding them accountable for what they want to do. And then expediting a permit review for affordable housing projects is another opportunity. Time is money, right? And I'm going to give it back to Allison. Um, so you you heard you did a little bit of discussion on uh, NOAA at the end, and they are all right. Like we we cannot build we for what we can buy. So the CDA um, our last housing development we built was in 20, 2009 in the city of Norwin Young America, and since then we've been buying because we haven't been able to fund a project. But we believe it's a combination of both. It's new construction and it's preservation. And so um, Trails Edge South is our new construction in Waconia. And I'm going to skip that and talk about that a little bit later. And then on the preservation side, we just closed um, a week and a half ago on the transfer of three rural development projects, um, two, par uh, two properties on adjacent parcels in the city of Watertown, 16 units each. And then a uh, property in the city of Mayor, that's 10 units, and that's through the USDA's Rural Development Program. And they were all built in the early 1980s, so we'll be putting about $1.6 million in to rehab them and pretty much touching everything in the building as far as what we're doing. Allison, is that rehab money easier to get than the new funding, the new bill um, funding? It, it can be, um, generally because you're, you're asking for smaller amounts. Okay. Um, so we got money through Minnesota Housing 
to do rehab, which we opted not to take because of some of their requirements. Um, but Greater Minnesota Housing Fund, they have a program um, specific for rural development. So Minnesota Housing, there is, it's, it's just less money, so it can be easier to obtain. Um, and then some of our future projects, which we intend to apply um, through Minnesota Housing next year for these three projects. We applied in 2020 at the same time we got funded for Trails Edge, but these three were not funded. So we own land in the city of Carver, and that would be 43 units of senior and 60 units of general occupancy, um, combined together by shared common areas to create an intergenerational living building. And then um, Trails Edge Senior is, would be on the adjacent parcel to Trails Edge South in the city of Waconia. And that would be anywhere between 60 and 76 units of senior affordable. And then we also own 20 acres of land that was donated to us uh, in the city of Watertown. That one has a pretty high infrastructure cost to move forward. So that's kind of been on the back burner for us. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm going the wrong way. And then I'm going to have Elise talk about our land trust program. So in addition to providing affordable rental opportunities, uh, the Community Land Trust Program provides affordable home ownership opportunities. So in 2009, uh, the CDA took over what was then the Chaska Community Land Trust and expanded it within Carver mm -hmm. County. Really, we're looking at serving households at 50 to 80% AMI. That's a pretty typical range for our home ownership opportunities. And actually, the number you see on the screen is Ron. We actually have 36 units now in Carver County. Uh, one of those is in Victoria here. Uh, just, you know, those are some interesting facts about home ownership and, and why it, it, uh, community land trusts work. But just, a, I'm a visual person. So the graphic you have here explains how a land trust works and what makes it different than a traditional purchase. So in a traditional purchase, you are going in, you are buying the house and the land as a package deal. What the land trust does, and this simplifies it a little bit, is it, it essentially separates the land from the, the building, the infrastructure uh, piece itself. And so you are deeded the building as the buyer, but then you lease that land. So the CDA, in this case, uh, retains ownership of that land and by doing that with land costs out here at fifty thousand eighty thousand dollars it removes that from that mortgage for those folks and by doing that you are allowing people at a lower income to buy into your community and one of the big benefits is um, that affordability period of 99 years so you may be sticking a lot of money in um, to that, uh, to actually buy that land. But when you um, amortize it out over 99 years, instead of 50 or $80,000 investment, you're looking at a $500 investment per year. Whereas if you take a TIF project, you know, you may be talking still $5,000 per unit per year. You know, so if you, if you look at it a little bit differently, uh, I talked a little bit how that land trust uh, project actually works. Uh, when you, when that homeowner goes to sell that property, and a lot of them do, and a lot of them move on to to buy a traditional home, uh, the uh, the homeowner retains 25% of that appreciation, while the remaining 75% stays with the home, which allows us to keep it affordable then for the next buyer. And then that 99 years starts all over again. Uh, these are just uh, some examples of developers with affordable housing projects in Carver County, as well as other affordable housing developers, which I think you saw this evening. Okay. All right, so um, I will have just quickly two examples to share with you, of, uh, just to show what it takes to pull a deal together. So Vista Ridge, I mentioned, um, opened in uh, the fall of 2020 in the city of Waconia. Um, it's 52 units. They have four units for um, long-term homeless households, four units for people with disabilities, and it, those eight units give them points with Minnesota Housing. Um, it's a 9% low-income housing tax credit deal. The city did a TIP district. Um, the city also did the water and sewer trunk fee waiver and then allow them to show proof of parking. And then more specifically, um, so I'll, I'm gonna 
uh, talk about our project, Trails Edge, which we just closed on in mid-October and we just broke ground on last week. To really to show what it, what it took to make this deal happen. So we bought this land back in 2009. We got city approval to develop. We went through the entitlement process in 2011 and we have been trying to fund it since then. We have been through two applications with the Met Council, two applications with Minnesota Housing, and we've also, most of the CDA, um, prod, uh, most of our apartment complexes are funded through either city or county GO bonds, and sometimes both the city and the county. Um, we tried to get it funded that way too, so and we were successfully funded in 2020. Um, so this, this project will serve households at, um, at or below 30% of AMI. It will have units for at or below 50% and at or below 60. So the entire building, nobody will be over 60% of area median income, but then we also target lower income households, so we get points for that. Um, and so obviously two things play into how many units you can develop on a site. One is what, what's the city going to let us build there, which the city approved us at 76 units. What's our market study going to support? And then the bigger thing, developers that are going after um, money for affordable projects, they're going to back into the number to maximize their points. So we started by looking at what's the, what's the most out of 76 we want to develop to maximize our tax credits, which was 60, and then what's going to get us the most points. And we opted to go after points for serving the largest, uh, largest families. So there's a formula that will tell you what your unit breakdown needs to be. So Trails Edge will be 15 one bedrooms, 32 bedrooms, and 15 three bedrooms. And that was all based on their formula and getting points. Um, we will have four units for long-term homeless and four for people with disabilities, and we get points for that. We will have eight project-based Section 8 vouchers through Metro HRA, and we get points for that. Um, this is strictly a 9% low-income housing tax credit deal, so it's tax credits and first mortgage only, which we're very fortunate we are able to do that. Because um, as Chris mentioned, a lot of times there's a lot of other funding with tax credits. Um, the city did the sewer and um, water trunk fee waiver for us. Um, the CDA donated the land to the project, which we got points for both of those. And then the city applied for the Community Growth Partnership in Initiative with the CDA. Um, but because of their uh, water and sewer trunk fee waiver, we actually ended up not needing that. And that was 85000 that we were able to then give back to the CDA because we didn't need it. And then I'll have Elise talk about land trust and our partnership with Habitat for Humanity. Uh, so just recently, uh, these are the two brand new units that came into the uh, community land trust earlier this summer. Uh, we are doing a, a joint project with Habitat for Humanity in Chaska at the Shepherd of the Hill site, if you're familiar with that on 41. Uh, in total, there will be eight uh, total units for, uh, for twin home sets, and all of these are home ownership opportunities, obviously. And the units will be kept affordable because they will be put into the community land trust. So you heard Kathy talk a little bit about now they are starting to move into partnering with community land trust to keep those units permanently affordable. This is a, a, an opportunity that is happening right in our own backyard. So how do we fund this? Obviously, the majority of this is funded through the sale of the units at the, um, at the end of the process. So there a lot of money goes in up front. Uh, Minnesota Housing, in this particular case, provided housing infrastructure bonds. So to the question about how many uh, Minnesota Housing applications have been awarded uh, in Carver County over the past five years, Allison talked about the four rental property, uh, four rentals. Um, we do have three, I believe, no, excuse me, four. Actually five. Because we five. have 2017. Oh, yes, 20. <laughs> um, we have five home ownership um, grant uh, um, awards. awards, thank you, through Minnesota Housing for the land trust itself. Uh, so those housing infrastructure bonds come in to cover the costs of, of the land. In this case, it was about uh, $70,000 for the cost of the land in each of these units. And then additionally, Habitat is bringing to the table um, housing impact funds, and that's needed if there's additional affordability gaps. So maybe uh, the income is a little bit lower of these homeowners, so they bring in some additional money. And then if need be, the city of Chaska, uh, we also have funds from the city of Chaska to lower that gap even further if we need to. So again, that layering of um, investment even happens at the homeownership level. 
Uh, so with that, we don't necessarily have next steps, but we are uh, happy to take any questions. I know that was a very fast overview. You have additional information in your packet this evening as well. Terrific. Thank you. And thank you for your patience with us. You guys had to sit through a long presentation before we got to you. I apologize and I almost let you go home without doing it. All right. <laughs> Council and commissioners, uh, questions for these ladies? Oh. I think they're going to let you off the hook. Oh, lots of information. <laughs> yeah, it, I have a quick it really question. is. Um, I noticed online you could find a 2014 CDA Maxfield study for housing in the in the Carver County area, and it was kind of accurate. Like it wasn't too bad. But is there a newer one that you've commissioned? Because typically counties do have a housing study. That, so the most um, recent housing study we did in this we did for each city, and it's on our website as well, we, I can send you know, the link. Um, we did a 2017 affordable housing ups, update by city, and we did that to help you with your 2040 comprehensive plan. So our website should have one the for each city. I think it was about 60 units in Victoria. Is the, did that stay about right? Or was do you not know? Um, actually, okay. I think the slide, let me see if I can find it real quick. There's one of the slides in the PowerPoint. I think Elise said it, um, she was the Met Council like breakdown of units. That's actually multifamily. So you, if you'll find that slide, um, and Dana has the PowerPoint, it will show you the breakdown of what the Met Council is expecting in the next 10 years for Victoria. Per city. Yeah, yeah per city. No, just specific to Victoria. Just, yeah. I was wondering when you put that up if that was Carver County or just nope, Victoria. No, that was just Victoria. So it was like 425 units, is that? Yeah. It was quick, but. Yes, right there. 434? Yes, 434 total, and then they break it down by affordability. That's a lot. Mm. And this is in Victoria, 400. This is just need. Victoria, yes. That's a wow. lot more than the housing study from 2014. Really good. Wow. So, so the 2017 housing study is probably a little bit closer to this. Um, but if you look at the 2017 housing study, the person who commissioned it for us, um, he so he listed the Met Council, but then did some of his own numbers too. So you might you might look at it and feel like maybe his might be less, and maybe that's more accurate. So his numbers didn't always. He listed the Met Council, but then also did his own calculations on what he thought it should be. So if we hit our goals, are we likely to have a higher score? As if we don't hit our goals? Yes, the number of affordable units you have does impact your housing performance score. So do we know how we did over the? 2010 to 2020 10 year period if that's the if we go on even numbers so that we can say <coughs> we did what we needed to do in 2010 and 2020 to 2020 and now over the next 10 years this is what we've got to do well uh, housing performance come out every year right it's every year yeah and so they'll they kind of add on every year how many new affordable units did you do what tools do you have in your toolbox that um, relates to your housing performance score every year then uh, we could, but, yeah, there's, Met, the Met Council has on their website, like you can go back and look at the housing performance scores for every year. So you could look at how you've done incrementally and you can also compare yourself to either other cities in Carver County or other cities in other counties that you might feel are more comparable to Victoria. And that's certainly, we can pull that information for you as well. Marty? Yeah, uh, Council Member Gunderson, Mayor, members of the Council, um, I'm trying to recall specific numbers. I know we did not meet our affordable housing goal from the previous comp plan, um, but I do believe that the total units, this 434 from 2021 to 2030, is greatly reduced from the 2010 to 2020 um, requested units um, from the Met Council, but we did not obviously meet our goals that last 10-year period. Well, our scores may tend to be lower because we're not meeting our goals. There's, there's other factors that factor into that so we, we score higher in other areas other, but um, yes we, we score low in that lower, lower in that area. particular category yeah okay all right okay council members commissioners any last thoughts terrific thank you thank so you much for having us all right now i'm looking at our staff this is all we have for this workshop so we have no more items to come before us, so I will entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. All right, we have a motion. Can I get a second? Second. Thank you. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? We are adjourned. We're going to take a five-minute break.